Christina Hasboon, and uh, I will be moderating this panel. Uh, as the title of the panel suggests, we will be discussing the um, amazing landscape of festivals in uh, uh, Asia. Asia is the world's largest continent and the world's most populated continent as well. And it has a rich uh, and diverse culture um, and many beautiful festivals. And we're really lucky today uh, to be able to have many of the wonderful directors who run festivals um, in the continent. And so we will be speaking about the festivals, when they're taking place, uh, how long do they go on for, uh, also, we will delve into the music that uh, they showcase, what types of music, what kind of musicians they, um, they host, um, in addition to perhaps uh, whether they have any um, events and workshops. And we will try also to touch on uh, the challenges that everybody is facing uh, during this crisis that has hit the music industry quite hard, uh, but at the same time, it has facilitated the cyberspace for all of us to come together uh, and meet in this, uh, ac across the border. Um, so um, yes, uh, we will be looking at three uh, videos from three of the festivals um, and uh, we will, um, they will give us an idea of these three festivals. Uh, they will run in order um, the Fuji Rock Festival, then the Al Balad Music Festival, uh, then the Roof of the World Festival. So um, please enjoy watching these three and then we will delve into our discussion and you will um, uh, hopefully enjoy it.
Okay, so welcome back everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I, I hope that you enjoyed uh, the three films and that they have given you a taste of the festivals. Um, I will now welcome our guests. Uh, we have a rich panel, as I said before, from Cairo to Japan, covering a diverse range of festivals. So um, I would like to start perhaps in Indonesia, welcoming Agus Satyawan Basuni, director of Warta Jazz. Hello, Agus. Hello. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello. Uh, also, uh, originally from Cairo, but currently in London, uh, Amr Salah, founder and director of the Cairo Jazz Festival. Hello, Amr. We can't hear you. If you can unmute yourself, please, and yeah. just say hi. Yeah, sorry. And, uh, yeah, Hi, everyone, and, and thanks so much for this uh, great opportunity, uh, privilege. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm based in London now, uh, but uh, running the festival from uh, uh, from Watford, England. Yeah, excellent, <laughs> excellent, lovely. Uh, Aya Nabulsi uh, from Amman, Jordan, executive director of the Al Balat Music Music Festival. Hello, Aya. Hi, hi everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. And Divya Bhatia, director of the Jodhpur Riff Festival in India. Hello. Hi, hi, and uh, welcome everyone. And I'm very, very uh, excited and uh, uh, looking forward to chatting with everybody. Hello to Jason after a long time. Nice. Um, a lot of people, by the way, here know each other. We also have together in one room uh, in Cairo, uh, Eleonora Ionotti, uh, founder and program director of IICI Consulting Management. Hello, Eleonora. Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure. Hello. And next to her, you will see Ibrahim El Shawi, director of El Ganoub Festival, again in Egypt. Hi, Ibrahim. Hi, everyone. Uh, looking forward to more cooperation with all of you. And let's have some fun music. Cool. Nice. And uh, in Thailand, we have Guillaume Guy, head of music for the uh, Wonderfruit music festival hi guys i'm super happy to be here um i think it's going to be very interesting to share with all of you guys uh some people i know some i don't so looking forward uh, to sharing uh, with you guys nice uh, in georgia founder and director of the kafka's jazz festival helen mechitova hello helen Hi, I'm Helen Mechitova. Um, Mechitova and all, I'm very excited to be a part of this panel and I'm looking forward to hear more and share it as well. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, Jason Mayol, director of Smash Corporation and Fuji Rock Festival. Hello, Jason. Jason is with us or was with us. Uh, however, he might have dropped. Uh, we will come back to him later. You have seen uh, the lovely um, video from his uh, festival. It's one of the oldest festivals in Asia. We also have Jun Lin Yo, artistic director of the Rainforest World Music Festival in Malaysia. Hello, Jun Lin. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Christina. Hello. Uh, Jun Lin was also an amazing moderator for yesterday's panel. So hello and welcome to you. Uh, from Amman, we have Lama Hasboon, director of the Amman Jazz Festival. Hello, Lama. Hi. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, uh, yeah. And let's clarify, we're not sisters, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, cool. And then we have Samandar Poladov, from, director of Roots of the World Festival um, in Tajikistan. Hello, Samandar. Okay, I can't hear him and I think that he might have dropped off. We shall come back to him later as well. And uh, last but not least, we have Teja Meru, uh, advisor of Task Force for Music uh, and Arts and also director of the Hornbell Festival in India. Hello, Teja. We can't hear you. Can you please unmute yourself? Who are you after? Uh, yes. Teja. 
Uh, Te jump Mero. And well, Jason, we're after you too. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah, had, uh, well, our internet connections are really bad in London. You know, we're, we're kind of third world country here. Um, There's global yeah. south problems. Uh, it's okay. Is it, internet is unstable as well as the country yeah, and the world right now. <laughs> Very unstable. I think the world is turning, Jason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was just. Uh, great. So this is uh, Jason Mayall, director of the Fuji Rock Festival. Hello back to you, Jason. Hi there, everyone. Nice to meet you all. And nice to see a few old friends up there as well. So good. Oh, great. And we will go back to Teja, director of Hornbill Festival <laughs> in India. Hello, Teja. Now we can hear you and see you. Yeah, so good to see you. Namaste. Namaste from Nagaland, India. It's a pleasure to be with you. And looking forward to hearing wonderful stories from around Asia and all the festivals. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, Asia Music Connect for making this happen. So uh, without further ado, let's delve into all of these lovely festivals that we have here. Um, if I might perhaps start with Jun Lin, uh, if you can tell me about the Rainforest World Music Festival, when does it place, uh, take place, how long does it um, does it go on for and sort of describe the setting? And I will ask each one of you to speak about your festival a little bit as well. So Jun Lin, please. Thanks, Christina. Um, Rainforest World Music Festival is in Borneo. And Borneo has three countries in it. It's a big island. The bottom two thirds belong to Indonesia and the top strip one third belong to two states of Malaysia with the country of Brunei nestled in between these two states. So we are in the state of Sarawak that belongs to Malaysia, right next to the South China Sea. And that's where the festival is sited as well. You know, one edge is the South China Sea and Santubong Mountains, not too far away from us. So uh, 2019, we were 22 years old. I'm, wow, that's I still a long time. Uh, well, not as long as some festivals here. I haven't quite worked out whether to count or not to count the missing 2020, so I haven't figured that out yet. Um, so it's a three-day festival, and we have about 24,000 visitors over the weekend. And in 2020, we were going to have an extra two nights in the city as a city stage, but of course that hasn't happened Yes, unfortunately, but hopefully next year it'll be bigger. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, Divya, shall we go to you uh, in India? And uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about the um, Jodhpur Riff Festival. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> uh, we are now in our 14th year. Uh, so still young. Uh, not, not as mature, not as mature as Jun Lin, uh, Jun Lin's festival. And the festival takes place in the town of Jodhpur uh, in northwestern India, in the state of Rajasthan, which is a desert state. Um, I actually live in Mumbai, which is where I am right now in my residence. Uh, so uh, my entire team actually lives across India. And the festival is primarily a festival for folk roots uh, and indigenous music from the region, but also from the rest of India and international. We do a lot of international collaborations at the festival. What's unusual about the festival is that it actually takes place not just in the city, but in a 560 year old palace, an old fort, uh, which sits on a rock uh, above the city. Um, beautiful. It's quite unusual. It's quite unusual. Yeah, and very beautiful. Also, we design, I designed the festival keeping the full moon in mind, because in India, our populations, traditional and even modern, Hindu, Muslim, a lot of people, uh, the moon is a major player. So the entire festival is designed around the movement of the moon, and the dates of the festival coincide with the brightest full moon in North India. And I think we're the only contemporary music festival in India. Our dates shift every year. Um, so this year, the dates are the 29th of October onwards. So I'm hoping I'll be able to hold a festival or at least a part of it uh, by then. Uh, but time will tell. Um, what Let's hope I so. must say, though, I just want to put this in. Yeah, uh, not to take too much more time, but uh, uh, the key 
purpose of the festival is really to impact the livelihood of the traditional performing artist of Rajasthan. That's it for me. Lovely, lovely, because it does focus on the on the roots w uh, within the, the region as well, correct? Um, yeah, uh, I think neighboring to you is um, Guillaume uh, and uh, the uh, Wonder Fruit Festival as well, if you can tell us a little bit about it. Yes, so um, we may be the, the baby festival here. Um, we're um, last edition was our sixth edition and we're planning our seventh edition that is supposed to happen in December. Um, it's, um, it's a festival that is happening uh, near Bangkok in the nature. Um, it's uh, uh, happening on a very, very big site. The site is as big as uh, 150 football fields. Uh, we have mountains, we have rivers, we have lakes, we have jungles, and we have a different uh, music stage in all this natural environment. Um, the uh, festival started as an initiative to promote sustainability. So we make, we have a lot of actions um, uh, towards sustainability. I can talk more about it later. Um, and um, and last edition, we th the baby is growing. Um, we uh, we are growing by plus fifty percent every year. Uh, so we reach about uh, fifteen to twenty thousand people on site per day. And it's a five-day, four-night festival with um, a music program that is running uh, all day, all night, all day, all night. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm the head of music, so I do all, everything related to uh, the music, so the bookings, but I also take care of all the uh, coordination, logistic, and also all the AV, so sound, lights, um, and everything. So. Great, great. Uh, shall we now go to Lama uh, and the Amman Jazz Festival? Lama, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Amman Jazz Festival? Uh, well, I think we're the youngest festival, actually. No, not really, but we're nine It's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, nine years old this year. It was supposed to happen in April, but we moved it to October, hopefully. And... Um, well, we have, um, uh, I'd like to say it's a very small, um, cozy festival that happens over five days in a theater. And then we have lots of uh, music performances happening across the city in public places, in pubs, in cultural centers. So, yeah, we take jazz everywhere. And, uh, yeah, the capacity is uh, small in terms of audience, because it's divided over like many venues and uh, small theaters. Well, I think that this is a challenge within the jazz scene um, anyway, <laughs> right? And it's the relationship between space um, and the venue. Uh, and in Amman, I guess that's one of the characteristics of Amman and it's one of the challenges of your festival, perhaps? Yes, true. And we're growing, but uh, slowly, slowly, but surely. Yes, and and uh, yeah, uh, like it's it's um, it sounds amazing, Jason um, and uh, the Fuji Rock Festival. So yeah, Fuji Rock, uh, first big international festival in Japan, started in nineteen ninety seven. So we're now into our twenty should have been our twenty fourth year this year. Uh, had sadly cancelled uh, along with everything else this year. So we're looking uh, next year, uh, August, end of August. Uh, our festival is big headline acts, uh, international, right across the board, uh, from heavy rock to electronic to folk music to soul funk Japanese bands uh, we get them from everywhere uh, audience is over 120,000 people over the weekend um, mm. quite a high ticket price it's up in the mountains it's in a beautiful location we cater to you know make sure the food's really good the music's really good and everything else is really good so that's that's oh, what we're great. up to and, uh, and how do people usually get to the festival? People, uh, we, there's um, 
a train that takes you to half an hour away by and so we have lots of shuttle buses uh, people come by bicycle by car uh, we have quite a bit of car parking it's a ski resort so it's geared up for taking lots and lots of people over the winter but in the summertime it's completely empty so we we literally have a quite good really good facilities on site um, but there's camping, so 25 to 30,000 people camping over the full weekend, which is quite impressive. Uh, nice. We can and often get. Can, yeah, Sorry? if you can just remind the, the audience, when does it take place? It usually takes place the, the last weekend of July, but considering the Olympics this year, we moved it till August. Uh, the end of August, so it should be in three weeks' time. So this year we've had to cancel. Um, there's no foreign foreigners allowed into Japan. There's no visas being issued. Um, even if you're a Japanese um, resident, but non-Japanese, you still can't get into Japan. So that's really put a, a nail in the entertainment conference for international artists. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're going to do something um, like a virtual, uh, like a recap of Food Europe this year on YouTube. So that's so you're of, still doing something. We won't be doing any events, but we'll just yes. be doing um, mm. re, you know twenty five years, twenty four years of Food Europe on mm. uh, on a YouTube channel over the weekend, a kind of streaming okay. thing. Not, Not as nice exciting as the real thing, I'm afraid. <laughs> But this is our digital reality at the moment. Mm, so um, sad, so sad. I mean, yeah. People like to, uh, I was listening yesterday to somebody's panel and he said exactly this, the right thing, which was people go to festivals, not for the music. They go to hang out with people. And so if you can't hang out with people, then it's a really sad world we would be living in. Uh, yes, um, I think... This this is a whole debate about physical distancing and social distancing and the implications of it uh, on our whole industry and how we're coping with it, which we will come back to uh, later. Uh, Teja, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about your festival? Sure. Uh, the, the Hornbill Festival is one of the biggest and the most colorful cultural festivals of India. It runs for 10 days. It's a 20-year-old festival. And every year is held from the 1st to the 10th of December. Uh, nice. So Nagaland is, uh, you know, we have 16 very colorful tribes. So it's a sort of a meeting of all the 16 tribes in their entire colors and food and dances. So it's been doing very well. Now, alongside the cultural aspect, we also host what we call the Hornbill Music Festival. Again, which, uh, which runs for 10 days. It's a 20-year-old music festival. And uh, just be, last year alone, we, 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 we had about 500 musicians who performed over three sort of uh, different locations. Uh, about five countries participated. Uh, so it's a growing festival, and we are very excited. Uh, unfortunately, this year, uh, we will have to be going digital, as most of, uh, of our, 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 our counterparts are also doing. Uh, but these are exciting times and we can't wait for times and things will really get to be normal again. And of course, through this discussion, uh, hopefully that our network also will grow bigger and you now we'll like, get to attend many of or all the festivals that have been, uh, pro uh, been discussed here and look forward to those days. Yes, there's some amazing settings and very unique ones as well, whether it's in nature thank or... Thank you. Thank you, Teja. Uh, whether it's in nature or in uh, in old cities and city centres, which brings me to Aya. Do you want to speak about the, the uh, Al Balad Music Festival? Yes, um, Al Balad Music Festival um, started in 2009. It's biannual festival, so uh, we're currently preparing for our seventh edition that will take place in June 2021. The festival takes place in the Roman Amphitheater in downtown Amman and the Odeon Theater. It's, it's a very authentic um, venue. Um, there is two theaters. So the small theater have the capacity of 500 and the bigger theater have the capacity of 6,500. So uh, it uh, usually runs for uh, five days um, with different uh, um, alternative Arabic music uh, bands and artists. 
residencies and um, international collaborations, basically. Nice. Uh, and it also brings the community together, right? Yes, Similarly to, to Lamas. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. you engage people. Yeah, of course. Uh, th this is the most important and the unique thing that we do. It's uh, the audience and the, the different um, audience backgrounds where they come together to, to meet in the festival. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Um, <laughs> Agus, perhaps would you would you like to tell us about the uh, Roof of the World, uh, sorry, Warta Jazz Festival? Um, okay, first I have to clarify that uh, the Warta Jazz is is not festival, but Warta Jazz yes, is uh, yeah. the end ecosystem of jazz in Indonesia, and we run at the moment ten jazz festival, ten different jazz festival. So uh, perhaps I didn't cannot tell the whole of them, but uh, when I explain to uh, uh, important festival, I think. Uh, one of them is the Ramadan Jazz Festival, um, which is this year supposed to be 10th anniversary but because of the COVID that uh, we, we can't do anything. Um, and we cannot also do it online because uh, uh, that's uh, in the holy month of Ramadan where everything just started like really uh, physical distancing, not allowing going anywhere, really lockdown. So I uh, can't do anything, but uh, it's being held in the mosque uh, and it runs uh, by Warta just together with the uh, youth movement in the mosque. So it's meant to be for the capacity building for the youth uh, in Jakarta and it's attended by 7,000 uh, spectators. 90% uh, of them is under 25 years old. Uh, so I would say we are the youngest ever uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the audience, um, and uh, if you uh, recognize uh, Joy Alexander, the uh, three time uh, in uh, consecutive years as the youngest ever Grammy Award nominee, is also performing in my festival before he's becoming famous. Of course, uh, that's the first festival. Uh, second festival, which I wear the uh, the uh, the T-shirt, is uh, a festival in the in Borneo, which meant to be to uh, promote uh, the idea of sustainability. This is in the beautiful uh, island, uh, which is unlike the other uh, festival, uh, we don't want to have more than 300 people because uh, for the sake of the island. It is a pristine water, uh, one of the last paradise in Borneo, I would say. Uh, this is actually uh, second best after Raja Ampat if you are in a diving and we call it Maratua Dive and Jazz Fiesta. So it's something that's totally different than uh, anyone else. Um, and uh, the beauty of things here is uh, there is no electricity. So uh, we have to build everything from like, you know, simple, small generators. And uh, the music is obviously the, what, the one that can blend with the pristine water and uh, while wow. you're enjoying your dinner. And so you it's acoustic have, uh, mainly. Yes, uh, uh, and, and you can see the whale shark is passing by. You can see some uh, uh, turtles uh, while you're enjoying the music at the same time. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, uh, this one is, uh, is located in the uh, East Borneo uh, in Indonesia. Um, and the one that I share in uh, Facebook today, i taking you, I think, uh, is uh, Reok Jasponorogo is the one in... Uh, uh, East Java that has uh, the biggest mask. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, the COVID, we have to wear mask. This one has the biggest uh, because the dance of the, the, the Reok and is meant to be connecting between jazz and the Indonesian culture, in particular, the East Java tribes. That's it. Nice. Nice. Um, and in Georgia, uh, how... I'm quite eager to know about the Kafka's Jazz Festival because the music scene there is like there's a lot of music in Georgia and it's unique. And oh, Thank you so much for such compliments. Um, we run festival since 2010. It's annual festival and actually it was created not in the sake of festival and not in the sake of jazz generally, but because of the peace building between countries that are we are 
uh, in between, it's like Armenia and Azerbaijan that unfortunately still have ongoing military conflict that just recently again escalated. And uh, maybe it's good that we did not have a festival this year. Otherwise, it would be a big problem for us. So we started as a peace building platform. And then in two years, we started to invite other countries to the festival because to take tension a bit down with uh, bringing other musicians from other countries. And um, this festival became a kind of creative platform for young musicians. So we're creating uh, positive narratives with music. We create new music. Uh, we unite musicians and also we uh, do some projects that then we can take abroad to other festivals. It's like not just Georgian project, Armenian or, or Azerbaijani, but it's something, a mixture of uh, cultures. And um, uh, but this year, of course, we had to cancel the festival. Um, and about the capacity of the festival, we are not uh, running a big scale festival because uh, it's also um, a bit risky for for us um, because of different confrontations and, and we are uh, trying to keep everything balanced. Uh, we have to take the crowd also under control. Um, and maybe it sounds a bit weird, but it's, it's like that because we don't want uh, to have any uh, escalations during the concerts or, or events. But uh, through these 10 years, everything went very good. Uh, we created a lot of uh, joint projects and we had a um, big tour in Turkey, actually, uh, having like four countries playing together at different events. But unfortunately, it was also cancelled. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. And uh, I also want to mention that I'm very pleased to be between uh, such amazing countries and festivals because it's the first time for me to get connected with Asian festivals because uh, we are on the edge. We are between Asia and Europe and it's problem with our identity as well. We still don't understand to whom we belong to Asia or Europe. So I'm very glad to see you all. It's nice to be an in-betweener <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> you have more options. Uh, great. Uh, and shall we jump to Eleonora and uh, Ibrahim in Cairo? And let's uh, attack Cairo, who are in-betweeners as well. Um, we were uh, out of Asia for the last year, for the last six years. What does it mean to introduce the smallest festival in the world? Because I know it's not competition, but we are the smallest one here. Uh, we started 2013. Uh, based on it's a, it's a small music gig and to, to, to listen to our musicians uh, during our vacation and spring break in Marsa Alam, it's uh, south of Asia. And then we start to grow bigger uh, every year. Uh, we reach it till we reach it uh, 700 guests uh, the last year, 2019. And then we decided to take the, the whole festival into another location into another level of organization and uh, planning and execution and operation. We moved from South of Egypt to uh, Sinai uh, at Ras Sidr, and now we are from part of Asia. We are not in Africa anymore. Uh, <clears throat> and we started to, co to collaborate with more, with more artists from outside of Egypt, not only the Arabic scene, not only the independent music scene in Egypt, and we start cooperation with outsiders, uh, international artists. Uh, however, we were planned to be on uh, April, April 2020, uh, and then COVID-19 attacked, and we are postponed till further notice. Uh, we hopefully, we are planning, hopefully, to have it in uh, October or December, some or sometime between uh, these, these dates. However, if not, we will plan for the next year uh, April 2021, inshallah. Hopefully. And that's where also Eleonora comes in, right? Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, just want to say that uh, we are still for the important message that stay safe, but we want to give another message of hope, you know, to start to be closer again to each other. That's why today we are sitting at the, the same table. But uh, definitely, I would just introduce briefly what is, um, what is my work at the moment in Egypt. I decided to, I'm a singer, but also a culture and development operator since years. So I decided to uh, represent a little bit um, a new reality also. It's a reality of to create a booking agencies, to give a kind of services to, um, to artists actually in Egypt and also abroad. 
I'm kind of, um, I'm Italian living in Egypt, so I decided that could be a very important message to create collaborations and support projects of mixed nationalities. And that's what actually my company is doing. So my company is giving services of promoting artists, supporting other festivals present in the country and abroad to have different kind of musicians and to support and present different kind of projects. So our collaboration with Ibrahim started because El Ganou Festival is actually a very good example, not only of two lands in the middle, because uh, Sinai is the place in the middle of Asia and Africa. And we exa exactly want, we want to give this kind of message. So create collaboration and exchange among artists and promote mobility among artists. That actually it's the main problem in Africa, in Asia, uh, to connect also with other realities and vice versa. So with Ibrahim, we decided that could be um, a nice step to collaborate also in the future to promote the mobility of new artists and to present new kind of project. So my company is technically trying to help and serving um, different kind of festival present in the country. And definitely, even if it could be the youngest of the festival we have, it's a very good, important example of World Music Festival in Egypt, who has a very complicated and variegated scene at the same time. So I hope that I gave a quick idea about what are we doing here. And I'm really pleased in it. Again, I want to say thank you for all the people who are participating in the panel for this amazing festival. And um, thanks to all the people that used to collaborate with us and that they will collaborate with us in the future. Yeah, th thanks for that, Eleonora. We will shortly delve into the music, which is something that we're all very passionate about. But... Uh, your neighbor here, uh, Amr Salah, runs the uh, Cairo Jazz Festival. Uh, so I would love him to tell us a, li a little bit as well about the Cairo Jazz Festival. Uh, yeah, thank you, Christina. And yeah, Cairo Jazz Festival started in 2009. And this is the year 12 this year, hopefully that we're going to run in November. Uh, so we have uh, usually takes uh, place in October and this year we have moved the uh, dates to be 12th to uh, to 20 21st of, uh, of November <coughs> um, it's a, a multidisciplinary jazz festival like it, uh, it show, I mean features um, performances other activities uh, uh, education Over how many days? Uh, and, well, this year we're going to run for nine days, which is, uh, uh, this is going to be a, like a, a, f a first time to do that. Uh, usually it was like, um, um, it was being held on, on three days, it took place on three days, like in the weekend. So this uh, this year we decided to expand the, the festival day, dates, so to allow more exposure and more uh, uh, like to relieve the program a little bit. Um, so not to be congested with, because that's that's how it used to be in the, when it was on the weekend. So anyway, so uh, we, 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 we do lots of many things like performances, um, collaboration between, the, between uh, artists, artists, residencies, um, galleries, jazz for kids, um, panel discussions. Um, yeah, we try to to like bring from here and there, like to um, you know make make a beautiful event that engages the community. Um, um, sorry, it's also dispersed across Cairo, correct? Yes, yes, and this is also one of the things that we uh, we 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 shifted to 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 do like the to work on um uh, in, on this format like to um like exp we we try to uh, disconnect from the from the idea of of being uh, centralized in in the venue so we don't want to be in the, in the venue uh, so we, we we would like to showcase like uh, here and there like in small boutique places, uh, bigger places, different different uh, like stage sizes. Um, this year we're having uh, twelve countries and, and, um, from uh, mostly from Europe. Um, we're having Chile from the for the first time this year. 
Um, yeah, in addition to the like the best uh, of the, the Egyptian lineup of jazz musicians um, uh, over the nine days. So yeah, I mean, it, uh, it's it's got lots of things. It's a, it's a very uh, a very 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 deep festival with lots of um, so many things Elements. happening inside. Yeah, nice. Yeah it, yeah, it sounds exciting. And there's also a film about the Cairo Jazz Festival um, <laughs> yeah, that documents yeah. it. Yeah, right. it, was, it was interesting Yeah, because it's, I mean, it started from nothing, this festival. It's, it got no support at that time. And it, it was uh, like quite interesting for uh, a German director who co came over to film this. Uh, like he was very curious to know how, how this big, big event is, is being produced with no support. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you, Amr. Thank you. Um, right, so I think one thing that we're all really passionate about, and that's why while we are in this um, path of our lives, is music, and um, and it is one of the strengths. I know that Jason said um, people come to festivals to hang out with each other, but they also come to festivals because of music, um, to enjoy music, to find out about new music um, and for the experience as well. So um, do you want to delve a little bit more? Maybe we start with Lemma uh, in what kind of music, what countries do you bring your acts from as well? A little bit of a, um, an overview of um, what you're looking for as well. Um, okay, uh, like Cairo Jazz Festival, the majority of the band, they come from Europe because um, we have a very little fund from the EU. So you'll find that we have like at least, at least five, six bands every year in the festival. And then the regional bands um, come next because there are less funding involved. And the third element is the local bands. Um, the jazz festival is independently supported, so we don't have a government fund, we don't get a cash sponsorship. Uh, actually, we get a very few cash sponsorship, but we don't have the corporate sector because it's jazz and jazz is very new to Amman and uh, uh, it's not really mainstream and the audience is uh, still niche, they consider it. So what we did is that we uh, established uh, on the side, parallel to the festival, with uh, also with the EU. So their, their support is very little, but effective. Um, an outdoor festival that happens on the staircases of Amman. So the staircases uh, are like an architectural connection between different neighborhoods, because Amman is on several hills. So we have beautiful staircases uh, connecting one area to another. So we started this small um, outdoor festival. Everybody who's in the festival, who's performing, they also perform in this outdoor festival and they jam together with local bands and then they, we celebrate and they get to know each other. So the most important thing about our festival is the experience. Uh, the experience that the bands get, they stay for a little while in Jordan, they get to know local musicians, they produce something together, they perform a lot. Some bands per perform like 10 performances uh, at the oh, same wow. time. So do you also take them on tours? Uh, well, we used to uh, organize regional tours uh, and we stopped since the crisis in Syria happened. Mm -hmm. And now then uh, we're gonna start the regional tour. Actually last year we had a very successful also regional tour, but not for every artist, just one. It was Eric Trufaz, done by our colleague, uh, from Egypt, um, Basim Abara, and he arranged a very nice uh, little tour for him from Cairo to Beirut, then uh, Dubai, then Lebanon. So that was very successful. And now, actually, uh, starting next year, we're gonna start this regional collaboration. We'll talk about it later, maybe. Um, and uh, yeah, and regarding the music, it uh, evolves all around jazz. Uh, we insist that we keep it jazz, but yeah, I mean, electro jazz, rock jazz, Arabic jazz, Latin jazz. We want to keep it interesting for the audience, just to attract their attention, to make them get addicted to what we do, make them wait for it from one year to another. And uh, because 
what we know here basically as classical jazz or standard jazz. And we only have very few um, Jordanian bands who play original jazz, very few, maybe, maybe two or three maximum. So what we do is we insist that every year we produce new projects and um, involve uh, the musicians from Jordan in a joint production for the international artists. Nice. Nice. Um, and uh, Jun Lin, in comparison to that, I guess that the Rain uh, Rainforest World Music Festival is quite diverse and you look at music from all across the board, different genres. Is there anything specific that you're looking for uh, in terms of music? Well, we embrace the world. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, it's world music. The, the festival is owned and um, supported by the Ministry of Tourism and the Strat Tourism Board. So, you know, we invite the world in where bands are concerned and um, audience as well, of course, because, you know, um, uh, to, to come into Strawak. So, uh, so I do everything from roots, traditional, uh, some more classical acts, world beat, collaborations, different music genres, um, DJs. But the glue that holds it together is that um, it must have some cultural or ethnic identity uh, element. So, you know, it's the world music. So we do local, regional, international bands, um, I'm looking for bands all over the world. We try to cover all the continents every year. Uh, we have eight stages. So from an indigenous stage to an indoor theater stage to several outdoor stages. Um, I also do a lot of mix and match of musicians um, from different bands and put them together in themed meetings for want of a better word, uh, where they, you know, showcase perhaps flutes of the world. Um, oh, sorry, and uh, would, that be, uh, would that be like a joint project that you organize within the festival? It's, it's on the spot. Oh, uh, wow, okay. <laughs> nice. So we, we put them all together, they meet each other for the first time and they end up playing together, friends forever. And, and uh, that is one of the elements of the festival as well. But yeah, they're just thrown in there together. And uh, so, you know, uh, we do lots of dance, interactive dance workshops, drum circles, tutorials, tribal long dances, which is why I've been wanting to meet Deja. Deja, I'm a great admirer of your Hornbill Festival. And last year I had the Santam Nagas here, which was just amazing. So I'm so happy to meet you. Uh, so we, we do everything. We do bits and bits of everything. Great. And perhaps this is where Teja can tell us about uh, your music and musicians and lovely dances as well. <laughs> we can't hear you. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Or I will unmute you. Um, have you tried? Okay. I'm trying. Okay, I've you unmuted you. Me? Cool. Yes, now we can, can you hear, hear me now. Yes. Okay, so like, like I said earlier, the Hornbill Festival takes place for 10 days. It's one of the longest festivals in the country. And I would say, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, it's one of the biggest uh, cultural festivals, cultural tribal festival. We have 16 very colorful, colorful tribes in Nagaland. And one thing that sets Nagaland unique is all the 16 tribes have their own way of life, their food habits, their dances, their their dresses, and even the, the songs and you know in their own dialect. So uh, it's a coming together of all the 16 very colorful tribes over the 10 days that happens at Kohima uh, at a place called Kisama, about a kilometer drive out from the capital. Uh, alongside this very exciting tribal dances and songs is also a very contemporary festival that runs called the Hornbill Music Festival, which is a 20-year-old, as old as the festival itself, the Hornbill Festival. And there we really have from rock to pop to K-pop, DJs, uh, all sorts of musicians come to perform there. 
we have contests that runs across the state, even across the country of India and four regions. And then they, they get it. We call it the ticket to Hornbill. So if you win that from Mumbai or Delhi, you get that ticket to fly in to play the big stage at the Hornbill. Uh, we have about uh, three venues over spread about over four, three to four towns, uh, a lot of box offices in cafes. Uh, last year alone, we sort of we had about we engaged with about five hundred musicians, uh, mainly from uh, the, uh, India, and uh, also from uh, from Indonesia, a DG from Indonesia, from UK, uh, from Hungary, and you know so and so forth. So uh, it's a it's a it's a growing festival. At ten years, we are we are still growing. We are still learning, and uh, yeah, so. I invite yeah. everybody to come. It happens in December. <laughs> yeah, if we can travel, that would be great. Uh, yes, Jason, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I guess uh, nearby is Jason uh, and the Fuji Rock Festival that was supposed to happen uh, quite soon. Which is, um, yeah. Do you want to tell us about how you, what kind of music you look into? Uh, do you have any favorites, uh, and what were you looking okay, for? Well, uh, the festival is a, it's a it's a commercial festival for a start, so it's not based on any kind of sponsorship or government money, or, or uh, it's strictly by the ticket sales. So we need to sell tickets to pay for the event. To sell those tickets, you need headliners. So it's really important on a scale of festivals like ours that you're giving the you, you're putting on the biggest shows in the world. So this year we had the Strokes booked um, and Tame Impala. And of course, those are the sort of bands that bring these incredible sh um, scale of production so that you can go and stand there in a field, but you can watch something that costs a million dollars or more. Um, we also have 17 stages. Uh, so you have, and the audience is very wide. So you have from, you know, from, old people like myself uh, and older and all the way down to you know, grandchildren and, and small kids so we accommodate and there's everybody. activities for them as well we we have a whole area of uh, of kids land we have um, circus we have uh, i'm always creating kind of artistic spaces uh, so people can find something new so it's it's not just about the big things it's also about the little things so, so we have the smallest nightclub in the world um, called the Minuscule Sound, which is um, four by eight foot uh, with a DJ in there, live music, uh, and literally you can get 10 people inside. So we have the smallest and the biggest stages. I think that's really important. Uh, talking about music, uh, Japan, uh, as a lot of countries, well, probably the, the most popular music is from the country of the of origin so Japanese music is the most popular music in Japan and it ac accounts for something like 80% of the sales in Japan so international music is a small market uh, comparatively you know it's uh, and if you think that that small market of you know that 20% of the whole market there is made up of you know you take your Taylor Swift your Beyonce your Rolling Stones and all the big names. When you start talking about bands like Kerrangbin or uh, some small hip hop band, nobody really knows them. So it's really important that your taste and the lineup that you put on is the best you can get. And we have a lot of bookers in our office, maybe 10 people, that all are out there looking for the very best in the world. And we work with you know the biggest agents and we keep our eye on what's going on internationally and uh, obviously locally in Japan. So that's really talking about artists and lineup. Uh, okay, any personal preferences, Jason? Any personal? I mean, me, I'm always looking for the most eclectic uh, bands. Uh, Jun Lin knows me from uh, Nara Serato. I booked a band from the Solomon Islands. I ended up managing them, uh, sending them around the world. I mean, I like the most obscure and the bizarre stuff. Last year, uh, like we're talking about collaborations. Um, I brought a band from Colombia called Frente Cumbiero and they played our couple of shows at the festival and I introduced them 
said, you've got to see this great Japanese band, Minyo Crusaders. Ended up Minyo Crusaders went down to Australia. Uh, to Columbia, uh, went into the studio with Frente and they're releasing a four-track EP collaboration uh, any day now um, and it's absolutely fantastic so to, to be a part of those sort of putting things together, Japan, Colombia, it just feels really, really great especially when the music's phenomenal uh, Frente Crusaders, the Minya Crusaders, anyway uh, excellent, there you go Okay. <laughs> uh, eclectic is good. Eclectic is always good because it doesn't get enough um, exposure. So it's uh, it's brilliant to get that. Uh, Divya, um, how do you choose your music for the festival? What kind of music is there? If I was to fly to Jodhpur, what would the experience be in terms of music? So, yeah, so... Um you know, a little bit of background on this is that when we started the festival, you have to understand that folk music in India was was persona non grata, talking about as recent as 10 to 15 years ago. Um, the predominant music in India, like Jason was saying, it's you know music from the country, which in India is ubiquitously associated with Bollywood. Um, so, yeah, so when we started the festival, it was really about creating an ecosystem that allowed the traditional musician of Rajasthan to find a place in contemporary society. And uh, to do that, we had to not only engage artists from across the country, but also across the world. You have to understand that all folk musicians in India are either low caste or considered to be marginal in an erstwhile quasi-feudal system that existed in the country. And Teja can probably corroborate this in, in his own experiences. Um, so it was really about a political as well as a artistic uh, decision to, to make this uh, festival. So we've heard about collaborations. We do a lot of collaborations. We've got albums released. We collaborated with the, you know, most of you will know this band called Sugar Nifty out of Scotland. Uh, we worked with Jeff Lang, who's a Australian blues jazz guitar player, slide guitar player out of Australia. We do a lot of work with jazz, folk and roots. Um, so at the festival itself, it's quite genre independent. I mean, I've had Wouter Kellerman, who's a South African composer, flute player. We've had Manu Chow, who's played, uh, you know. So, so I'm really looking like Jason. I like the eclectic. I really wanted to get that band from the Solomon Islands. I spoke to Jason about at Army some many years ago. It was just very difficult. Um, yeah, so so very interested in jazz, very interested in street punk, which is more contemporary, more and more looking at hip hop. The challenge really is the language more than anything. Uh, there are some great hip hop bands in the world. Um, getting a lot of reggae. Uh, definitely doing some, what we try and avoid at the festival is really looking at Indian classical or Bollywood music. Uh, we are not a commercial festival, though a lot of us, are, our income is from ticket sales. Uh, we are not for profit. Um, and we actually produce collaborative work and send it across to different parts of the world. We've, we've showcased at Womex, uh, performed at the Cervantino Festival in, in Mexico, uh, taken to a lot of uh, shows and uh, tour in Australia. So we're really looking to collaborate first and foremost. So when I'm traveling, I travel the world to look at artists. Um, it's really find artists who have some uh, sensitivity towards the, the texture and the language of, of what a folk or roots or traditional indigenous artist has. And that artist could be anybody. It could be a contemporary artist. We've collaborated with DJs, etc. And the hope is that we will create products which have a longer life, not just at the festival, but also take it beyond. And, and we've created groups which now travel the world. Um, the big challenge, of course, is, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but the reason why we work so much with the folk musicians is because uh, they're highly talented artists, but extremely poor uh, in, in Rajasthan. And yes, it's and a hardship for them. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so, and I think it's very important to highlight the fact that giving voice to those who are unheard is very important um, on stages. Yeah. 
Totally, everywhere. And the reason why we do the festival in this fantastic fort is because traditionally, these very folk artists would be coming in through the back door. They would never be allowed into the main, main areas. So it's quite a radical shift in a semi-quasi-feudal state to actually have the artists take center stage, who otherwise would not be allowed into the main palace whatsoever. Um, one last line I do want to say, I know there was some talk about COVID. So right now, because there's no work for these artists, there's not even work for them as laborers, we've actually been running a relief program. It's the first time the festival was never designed to run relief work, but we've had to do it. We couldn't not do it. And we've been quite successful. We've supported about uh, 1,500 families so far with food and now with income. And uh, Song Lines did a very small but lovely piece on that work. I think it's very important at this time not to forget uh, that uh, our musicians are, are so critical to our lives and, and to our cultures. Yes, I think that the import the the fact that the music industry has been hit so hard uh, by the um, this crisis, we are the last to be opening. Most probably, uh, there's still no clear guidelines or plans for when live music will be back. Uh, there's a lot of challenges that we will be facing in the next year, and perhaps um, even longer. So. Maybe since we don't have that much time left, uh, shall we discuss a little bit what challenges um, are you now facing and how are you trying to cope with the uncertainty that's uh, in the air? And um, coming back to uh, Divya's uh, uh, pointing out to, 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 to the music of minorities and, uh, and those who are perhaps marginalized. Uh, maybe Teja, you can elaborate a little bit uh, on what's happening with you. Uh, yeah, over the last few months, uh, it's true, like you said, that many have lost jobs, gigs. Hello. Okay. Yes, Teja. Yes, we can hear you, but we have lost a uh, signal. Okay, we are having problems with Teja. I think there's um, signal problems. Um, perhaps, uh, Guillaume, would you like to talk about uh, your festival a little bit? And we go back to uh, Teja once he's back. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, Wonderfoot is, is, has a little, um, is probably a little bit different compared to other festivals. Um, um, to give an idea, we had um, 22 different stages last edition. Um, the more the festival is growing, the smaller the stage capacity are. Um, we are not a music festival, we're an experience festival. I'm the head of the music department and, um, and there's six different departments proposing content. So um, having a wonderful experience is, an ex is, is, is a very rich experience where music is one part. Uh, about the music, uh, every single, we have stage um, that are uh, proposing underground techno music in the jungle. We have stages that are proposing atmospheric jazz by the river. We have stages that are on buses moving around the, um, the nature, we have Guillaume, stages for... Whoa. Sorry to interrupt that, but that, that sounds amazing. But are you looking into social distancing or physical distancing between these people now? Or how is it looking? So, so this festival is happening in December. We're still looking at the date to confirm the date. And we're still looking at how the, re uh, the regulations are going to evolve. But right now, there's no cases in Thailand. So there's still some regulations to follow. Uh, some social distancing rules, but in Thailand, we're basically a COVID-free country at the moment. So uh, we're still waiting to see how things are going to evolve. But you have 20 to 80,000 people festivals that are uh, going ahead uh, by end of this year. So um, uh, well, let's see how things will evolve. But uh, on sorry. our side, yeah. Guillaume, and are you getting international acts in? Um, so let's say that um, as long as international people cannot fly in the country, uh, it's, um, it will be a little bit difficult to book them. So uh, right now we're focusing more on 
um, the local market. Um, we we had last um, uh, we had last edition um, uh, 383 acts books uh, booked. Sorry, so uh, the amount of music is is enormous. If if you put all the music program on one stage, the stage is running 24 hours per day, nonstop during three weeks. Um, so, and, and uh, about a third to a half of the program was uh, with local uh, artists or local acts or r uh, people uh, who are Thai residents. So we have more than enough to propose a quality lineup. Uh, one thing that we are uh, proposing now is um, we're starting to produce shows, and that's something a little bit new. Um, so we're looking, basically we're creating original content. Um, we're working with local producers, and we're putting together shows. Uh, we're, I cannot talk too much about it because it hasn't been announced yet, but um, we're also collaborating with um, international artists uh, to put these shows together. We're producing short films, um, our ethos is sustainability, protection of the environment. So uh, we're also starting to do um, uh, a show about wild uh, trafficking um, to raise awareness towards these, um, uh, these problems. So we're basically diversifying um, the content that we're proposing uh, to still propose a quality experience, uh, but go a little bit beyond what uh, local artists can propose. Okay. Um, th there's one more thing that I'd like to add, which is super important: is um, um, we uh, there are wonderful stages, but there are also other stages that are managed by other promoters, uh, which means that um, some promoters, also internationals, can build their own stage and have their own curation at Wonderfruit. Um, so we call these stages camps. Um, and last year we had six or seven camps. Uh, we have also other festivals that are curating some of our stages. Uh, we had, for example, uh, Rainbow Disco Club in Japan that was proposing, that was uh, hosting one of us, our stage. We have labels and curators um, that are curating stages um, like Erase Tapes in UK and Bangers in France, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's also something that is very special at Wonderfruit, proposing other people to being part of it and propose yeah. also a little bit of their flavor. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps this is the time to start looking into neighboring countries and uh, and facilitating maybe uh, travel and collaboration with festivals that are nearby. Is that something that uh, any of you have looked into? I don't know. Maybe Teja, can can you, uh, uh, if you would like to come back in and speak about your challenges and whether you've looked into this? Um. Yeah. Uh in this particular time, we have really tried to support our musicians, especially back home, by doing online activities. We have created a lot of online concerts using our Instagram uh, handles, uh, and they've been going live on air, reaching out to you know uh, the audience, their fans, and the audiences elsewhere. Uh, we also we have brought in. Uh, we are also focusing a lot uh, of using the digital space to have talks like this through Zoom or to uh, you know, bring people, experts, thought leaders in the music industry to, to share the knowledge, to share the skills on the business of music, how to sell your music online and many more. In fact, we collaborated one video just about two months ago of 10 countries singing together the very famous song, Imagine by John Lennon. So we have been reaching out uh, to all our friends and partners across the world uh, doing this. Uh, as for our music festival in December, if things don't improve, it, uh, we will go all digital. Uh, that's what that is the plan, all out digital, and maybe with a sort of a maybe a small drive-in concert with complete standard or sort of safety operation in place. People will drive in, have the little squares and circles where they will actually sit or park their cars. There'll be a live stage. And uh, they will they will get to listen to the music either connected to the FM radio on their car, or um, and have that live audience experience. So uh, those are the two things that we are thinking. And yes, definitely reaching out to other countries is on a big agenda. In fact, uh, we have just uh, Russia has a 
very big festival called the V Rocks Festival that takes place in Vladivostok every year. And we just become festival partners. And uh, so that's an exciting trend that's happening. So if we can, even if we can't meet in person, uh, we will continue to explore all digital sort of avenues, uh, technologies available to continue to create music and bring that music experience to our friends, families, and, and music lovers across the world. That is our plan. Till things improve. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, Aya, um, <laughs> what about you? What are you doing regionally? Um, well, uh, actually, uh, Al-Balad Music Festival, we work uh, mainly with uh, the local talents and the local bands. Uh, we usually uh, try to uh, launch new projects uh, for the local bands. Um, um, also give, give the space for... for young and emerging artists to showcase and perform their projects on our stage. Uh, also, uh, we do this kind of collaborations and residencies uh, between regional, local and international artists. So we gather everyone from all over the world. Uh, we invite them for the residencies, whether it, was, it, it, it might be in Amman, in Jordan or and Lebanon, for example, and then they will showcase um, and uh, bring together the project uh, to perform it uh, in Al, Al Balad Music Festival and then uh, to travel with it. Um, also, uh, we do these uh, meetings uh, to discuss and introduce artists to each other um, and and uh, uh, like to connect people um, and especially the artists that are from the region, like from Jordan, Palestine and Lebanon, uh, to meet uh, international professionals for them to, to um, you know, to connect and have uh, uh, different opportunities. So um, uh, this is mainly um, how things are. We, we, we focus also on um, um, having... Uh, new projects uh, to bring in new projects so for example the same band can uh, participate in the in the festival for two uh, editions in a row but with a different project so um yeah okay nice uh, nice thank you for that and Junlin, how are you finding the challenges at the moment um, are you trying to look uh, close by regionally uh, are you looking into perhaps doing more courses more uh, collaborations more marketing Borneo is an island anyone mm -hmm. from outside of Borneo has to fly in so mm -hmm. you know big challenge um, and as Jason everyone um and, you know, people I've been listening to in Global Toronto the last couple of days. How do you go online with a festival? It's the, it's the energy between the, you know, the audience, the, the musicians. It's the whole immersing into an experience, as um, Guillaume was saying. Um, it's It's food, it's the activities, it's the whole excitement of being there. I'm not sure how festivals can go digital, but we're going to have to do something next year, and we will, hopefully live. <laughs> we need that vaccine, we need live music back. Um, you know, how to do world music if we don't have the world? Totally, totally. Um, uh, Agus, perhaps would you like to um, say something about the, um, the connectedness and not being connected as well? Okay. The challenges. First thing that I would like to highlight that Indonesia probably compare with the populations uh, and the one that being presents in the Instagram, we are the largest one. Uh, there are 733 73 million uh, Indonesians, mostly youngsters under 35, uh, uh, 30 years old. Um, while the other countries, like uh, the biggest one is uh, states, 130 million, India, 100 million, Brazil, 91 million, compared to the size of the population is like, you know, um, is, is completely different than the one that in Indonesia. Why I mention this? Because uh, in about two days, we will announcing 
the uh, a project that we call uh, 202880 2020 um it is a project to celebrate 20 years of anniversary of Warta Jazz uh from the ultimate jazz source to become uh, the an ecosystem of jazz in Indonesia which is <laughs> Nice. Uh, and sorry, and how is that dealing with the challenges? Um, are, are you that's taking... What I'm, that's yeah. what about I'm, 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 I'm talking about. We okay. are uh, helping to promoting uh, Indonesian jazz and world music artists to the world. And we facilitating the world of jazz and world music to Indonesians by first um, to create uh, uh, this project uh, in about 20 days. We are calling every single jazz musician that still live on earth to join us. And we're making a global list of jazz millennials, which is uh, the one that born 1980 to 1995. So any of you who are watching this and you are files the category of jazz and world music, you can contribute by making an arrangement of Indonesian children's songs. Why children? Because uh, we used to be uh, a children, uh, kids, you know, and then some of us may have kids and the future is belongs to the kids. Okay, and, that's a nice one. That's a nice, that the and, children... And basically, yeah. and basically, we would like everyone to together uh, in November because we're going to make the Indonesian World Jazz Expo and it will be connected through the online thing, you know, so... It's, it's open for everyone to join in, and uh, I welcome you all. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Agus, for that. Um, now I'm trying to think where haven't we been, perhaps uh, um, uh, Jason, Japan, or uh, okay. Helen uh, in Georgia. Or Jason, yeah, so you social distancing, how it works. Currently in Japan, it's the, this, the venues are starting out with a 50% capacity. So I think certain shows can go on with 50% capacity. So certain small clubs are happening um, with, you know, small numbers. Uh, no international acts, as I've said, uh, are allowed into Japan. Or, so there's, there's no chance of uh, gigs going on. We do our company, not just Fuji Rock, but we have another festival in October. We're currently in decision as to whether to... Um, hold that festival um, in October with just Japanese bands, 50% capacity, but with the troubles of um, access, transportation, local lockdowns, which are happening, you know, in all over the place. Um, certain prefectures will close down, uh, locking in. So I think the, it's pretty unreliable that things are going to get back to normal for well till hopefully we're looking at um rescheduling shows um headline shows of international artists we're looking at rescheduling those from march april may possibly next year but you know my fingers are crossed for glastonbury happening in june next year but considering the way it's going in the uk right now it doesn't look that promising I'm afraid. no no the uk looks um challenging i mean no, we might just, yeah it's not just the uk it's all over europe it's all over the world and if people cannot travel then you know things are going to get a lot smaller and festivals will be more and more localized festivals so i think it, we should be not looking to go huge we should be looking to go small that things like coachella festival in America, Glastonbury Festival UK, these festivals, Roskilde, where you have two, three hundred thousand people attending, these are the ones that are going to be hardest hit. I think the smaller nightclubs, um, smaller festivals like um, World, you know, the Rainforest Festival and sounds like the Hornbill Festival are able to small and build up locally. But on a big scale, this is uh, this is crippling. I think for the industry. So we're going to have to find another way out of this. And I'm afraid it will not be digital. No, I, I'm not sure whether digital is the, um, is the way we will 
uh, soon be ending this session. I would just like to ask um, Helen to briefly uh, jump in and brief us on the situation in Georgia before we wrap up. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to mention that because of the um, pretty good situation uh, with the pandemic in Georgia, generally, we closed all borders and everything. And uh, now we have a time to organize uh, at least local concerts. So we have these gatherings, even if it's forbidden, but still people are organizing a lot of concerts because otherwise... Um, we are a third world country with a very weak economy. So if we stop everything, it's difficult to survive. We made the research about musicians who lost their jobs and their income. So we approached the city hall to make some, uh, to organize like these small concerts or make residencies to help musicians. Um, so, and even now I'm organizing two concerts open air, but not under the festival because my festival has completely different concept and without countries, our neighboring, neighboring countries, it doesn't make sense to organize it. So this is how we are trying to keep musicians working at least during the summer because from the September, we don't know what will happen. But in the long-term uh, perspective, this will be very tough for us because all our 10 years that our festival uh, exists, we were preparing a base to make these international cooperations and to start moving uh, uh, artists, bringing, uh, taking. And now all these 10 years just, I mean, it, it's yes. done. I, I think mm -hmm. for two next years, uh, we should forget about this uh, active traveling and so on. But now I, we are taking the possibility of uh, not we are not digitalizing now but we are using the time just to make contacts to think how we can revise it for the next year because definitely for 2022 uh, we will not get back to the same level as we were no, already no so we won't helen yeah. i will have to cut you off there okay. i'm very sorry but we have to wrap up i would like to uh, thank everyone for being here for Asian Music Summit for Global Toronto. Uh, sorry we didn't get through to your questions and we didn't manage to cover this really rich and vast topic that we need to delve deeper into. Thank you everyone uh, for being with us, uh, for contributing uh, your festivals. Um, Please, uh, to the audience, if you would like to visit the websites um, or Facebook or social media of each one of the festivals that are here, then please do that. And um, also um, stay tuned. Uh, we will be taking a break for 28 minutes um, and then we will be coming back. If anyone would like to say any final thank yous or, um, uh, or any final words, please do join me uh, now before... Um, we wrap up this session. Uh, perhaps uh, Lama, you have been essential in uh, bringing all of this together and uh, uh, and making this materialize. So thank you for that. Thank you for everybody. Thank you for all the participants who, is, who have been very active with us and very responsive. Um, this is the first uh, Asian Music Summit. And so happy that it came to life with, uh, under the umbrella of um, Global Toronto and in partnership with them. And I'm so excited. We're all excited about this first edition. So I just want to tell everybody thank you for joining us.